welcome to this lecture on the period between uh, January 30th, 1933 and um, August 1934 in Germany. This is quite often known as the period of the Gleichschaltung or the bringing into line. I'll to explain a little bit more exactly how that worked a bit later on. Basically though, it was about National Socialists and that's his consolidation of their power and to do that, the use of terror. We look at um, before we go on to look at that. Let's just see the way pe some people viewed Hitler. On the left-hand side, you quite see, quite clearly see a photograph of a family, and more, most importantly, the man on the right-hand side there is uh, ex-soldier, quite proudly displaying his Iron Cross. On the right-hand side, the writing from a, a diary from 1933 is about what Louise Solmitz wrote about uh, Hitler's visit to Hamburg. And the way she describes it is quite clearly in adoration of, almost to the point that she is deifying him, in other words making him all, almost out to be a god, as well as the idea that he was a, a saviour of the fatherland as she saw it. So what was happening uh, before the Reichstag fire? Well, um, this was one of the key build-up points towards how the, German, the Nazis took over Germany and the first thing they did was what was called a decree for the protection of the German people. Two points on this. First, that not only is this about the German people, and we're beginning to get a very racial uh, point about this, but more importantly this was a decree. In other words, this was not a law passed by the Reichstag and rubber stamped by the Reichsrat. It was um, and meant that it was basically put out by um, the government. Um, it's not often they could do this, but what happened as a result of that was that many people could be arrested without charge, and the SS and the SA used this to arrest many of their political opponents later on. The SPD and the KPD didn't um, fight back, as they had been doing uh, quite often, especially the KPD, in uh, street battles across, uh, throughout Germany during the early 1930s, mainly due to the upcoming elections on March the 5th. But before we got there, we had what was known as the Reichstag fire. This was, the Reichstag of course was the German parliament, and um, in late February uh, 1933, it burned down. The person caught was um, van der Lubbe, a, he had mental health problems, that was quite clear. Secondly, and this was the main gift for the Nazis, he was a communist. Whether he was actually involved in it or the Nazis uh, set him up, we don't fully know. But they certainly used it to their uh, advantage, to the extent that we can see here that um, the communists are quite clearly blamed for the Reichstag fire, as the, and they, weighed, they uh, made it out to be was an attack on democracy, even though Hitler and the Nazis had no uh, love for democracy, and quite clearly blaming the communists for that, as I say. Here we have uh, a photograph of uh, the said uh, van der Lubbe, but also on the right-hand side, Georgi Dimitrov, who was the person in charge of the uh, Central European Comintern, which was the organisation set up by the Soviet Union, the Bolsheviks in the Soviet Union, to further revolution in uh, countries beyond the borders of the Soviet Union. Um, he went on to defend himself very well and made a big name for himself uh, at his trial. Um, he was found in the end not guilty. Later on, um, he became uh, leader of Bulgaria, in fact the first communist leader of Bulgaria. Not so fortunate for van der Lubbe, who was sentenced for high treason and later executed. So what was the aftermath of the Reichstag fire? Well, the, because of the decree mentioned before, there was an escalation of terror. Political opponents arrested and brought into the early concentration camps. Two points about this. First, when we think about the concentration camps, it's the political opponents that are being picked up first of all. They are the ones who are being arrested. Not the Jews, not the uh, gypsies. Um, but the political opponents, basically members of the KPD and the SPD. And when we think about, and the second point I want to make here is about the, uh, when we think about concentration camps, we often think of large-scale places with barracks and barbed wire. This
this is not the case. The first concentration camps would often be disused buildings, quite often factories or whatever, and the people would be, as I say, arrested and taken to these places and kept under armed guard. They were a pretty awful place at the best of times, but obviously with the overcrowding, as you can see on the 15th of March, 10,000 communists were arrested. Prior to that, though, um, there was what was called, again, notice this, the Reichstag Fire Decree. This gave a limit, a limit of freedom of press, of opinion, of personal freedom, freedom of meetings, house searches and confiscation of property, and all land would be given over to the government. Uh, basically, this gave a judicial base for what followed, and that meant that, basically, terror. So what happened uh, then? Well, there was the uh, May March elections. Um, this, as quite clearly, this wasn't an independent election. There was massive intimidation, especially in the smaller towns and villages, which the Nazis quite clearly could control much easier. Berlin, interestingly enough, was very hard for the Nazis to control, mainly because it was always known as Rutter Berlin or Red Berlin. Even though, even with all of this, the Nazis could only get 44% of the vote. The combined uh, the votes on the left still was 30%. Um, but having said that, by combining with the racist DNVP, um, that did take them over the 50% barrier. And here we have uh, the diagrammatic representation of the election. Here we have what happened next, which was the Social Democrats pledging themselves um, for humanity and justice, uh, as I say there, against what became known as the Enabling Law. I'll let you read that yourself, because what I want to go on to look at was what the Enabling Law meant. And here we have uh, the two articles. The first one is the key one. In addition to the procedure prescribed by the Constitution, i.e. decisions by Parliament, laws of the right may also be enacted by the government of the right. The government, in other words, the cabinet, essentially Hitler. In other words, he could make laws himself. Here we have uh, a photograph of a uh, key event, which goes, and here we can see a little bit more of it. This was at the Garnison Church in Potsdam, a city just outside of Berlin. Uh, of the new Reichstag and basically it was stage managed by the Nazis you can quite clearly see many people in Nazi uniform there but also Paul von Hindenburg the president was there and other members of the Junker aristocracy and the elites this was meant to show the new elites and the old elites combined together and as you can see here as a result of the enabling law Hitler so basically is asking for a four-year plan. Um, the KPD, basically, uh, all their MPs um, were banned. They could not vote. And as a result, he managed to, Hitler managed to get a two-thirds majority, which gave him the ability to change the constitution. Interestingly enough, the Zentrum party also uh, were crucial in the margin of victory of this because they basically voted alongside the extreme right. Only people who could vote against this would be SPD and they and that is what they did. This led basically to Germany being made into a dictatorship. And here we can see quite a famous um, piece of artwork. The the slates you can see there's ninety six of them and they are all the murdered Reichstag deputies, most of them being SPD. Um, you can see that when we go to the Reichstag later on this year, unfortunately the uh, security um, barriers are all around it, so you can't see it as well as you used to be able to, as you can see there, but I will try and show you a bit later on. So the finalising of the transform, uh, transformation of power, there was uh, first next up was the restoration of professional civil service, basically removing the Jews and political opponents from public service. The Catholic Church cautiously supported the new regime, interestingly enough, through the Concord after July 1930. Basically all other parties uh, were dissolved, and so you basically had no opposition to the Nazis. This was a new kind of state, this was a totalitarian dictatorship. And the Nazi party, and this is how it uh, basically functioned, but what you've also got to realise, even though the Nazi party there, is that not only 
because it, it was the party but also the government so they refused together the party and the government refused together so um, you can see here the different levels of the Nazi party but effectively that was also the way the uh, many parts parts of the government were so the region the gal the district the Christ uh, smaller groups than the cells and basically blocks so people in a street block you'd have one member who was a member of the Nazi party and they were in charge of that and could report you and you could be then be arrested and quite possibly never seen again. Here's a part of a speech that Hitler gave at the very f famous Nuremberg uh, party rally in 1935. If you go on to uh, YouTube you should be able to see um, uh, clips of that from a very famous film made by uh, Leni Riefenstahl uh, called Triumph of the Will well worth uh, what, uh, reading this because this gives the idea of that Gleichschaltung aspect I was talking about, the putting people into line. Nazi organisations wanted to make sure that the youth were um, coalesced into the Nazi party as well, so you've got the different levels going all the way back from uh, six year olds up to ten, right up to the um, from boys this is, up to the army and the same effectively for the girls starting at the age of ten. This is uh, what a Social Democratic Observer in 1938 wrote about what he saw as the, um, what we might call the brainwashing of children at this time. Again, well worth reading. Ernst Röhm, who was leader of the SA, uh, we can see there, if you look at the date there, 1934, that is crucial because what happened was a law was passed called um, the law regarding measures of state self-defense basically issued by Hitler himself and um, there was a single article the measures taken on the 30th of June the 1st and 2nd of July 1934 in order to put down attacks of high treason shall be legal state self-defense basically this is a law that being put together after the event in other words this was to do with what became known as the night of long knives where um, all the uh, key um, opposition point p p people within and just outside of the Nazi party were basically murdered by members of the SS on the orders of Hitler. Basically large numbers of SA who were seen as a threat to Hitler and crucially the German army, uh, the Strasser brothers, um, chancellors who were, could be seen as uh, key opponents, basically anybody who could be seen as an, uh, as an opponent was murdered and this law basically was made after that in other words, these were people considered, as it says here, um, as, as, as being accused of high treason and therefore the murder was okay. Next up was the, the, ins the insurance of uh, the, the army would also come into line. And here was an oath that the German soldiers had to give. You notice it was to the Führer uh, of the German nation, not to the German people or Germany itself but to the Führer so this was the final bringing into line and here we have uh, this is a little bit late 1938 the way the Führer saw himself okay uh, the constitutional law in the Third Reich is the legal formulation of the historic will of the Führer and here's a key um, table here about Hitler's strategy about the different use of uh, things like propaganda uh, concessions, terror intimidation, and there's that word again, the Gleichschaldung or the coordination. Very useful, have a look at it, make notes on it.